Okay. Hi, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, I'm using my. I don't know. This mic doesn't work very well. I don't think. Can, it, can the people in the back hear me? Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So, hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's uh, special MSI public talk. We're thrilled that you're all here, both in person and online. Um, I'm Carolina Cruz Vinacho. I'm the program administrator for the MSI. And a few logistical details before we get started, and then I'll pass it along to Vicky and then to Alan. Uh, so first of all, MSI is committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we can only share all this astro awesomeness if everybody feels safe and comfortable. So if, um, if you have any concerns at any point during the evening, or if you're feeling uncomfortable, you can just email, like, let us know we're here to help. Uh, but basically, let's just everybody be nice to each other. Um, you should have seen at the front door that there was a QR code. So basically, uh, that's because we're raffling off some prizes. They're here at the front. Uh, if you want to be entered in the raffle, you should fill out the form. We'll flash a QR code at the end of the talk so you can fill it out if you haven't already. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll be taking questions from the audience during the Q&A period. So for everybody that's in the room, you, you, you'll be able to like raise your hand and ask your question. For the people online, type your question in the chat and we'll pass it along to the speaker. Some of you also submitted questions beforehand. So we'll be asking those as well. Um, so okay, I think that's it for me. So I will now pass the floor to MSI Director Vicki Caspi, who will int introduce tonight's speaker. Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to tonight's uh, lecture. I'm just curious, are there any former 183 students in the room? Yeah, welcome. So, and I'm happy to see everybody. But yeah. Okay, uh, Okay. so Alan Stern. Alan Stern is an American engineer and planetary scientist. He is the principal investigator on the New Horizons interplanetary mission to Pluto, which launched in 2006 and reached Pluto in 2015. Uh, it was the first mission to explore the dwarf planet. New Horizons also, as you'll hear, New Horizons also did a flyby of a Kuiper belt, ob Kuiper belt object in 2019. Uh, Alan was born in New Orleans and attended the University of Texas at Austin, where he received his bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy and his master's degree in aerospace engineering and planetary atmospheres. He earned a doctorate in astrophysics and planetary sciences from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He has been involved in 24 suborbital orbital planetary space missions, including eight for which he was mission principal investigator. He's also developed eight scientific instruments for planetary and near space research missions and was executive director of the Southwest Research Institute Space Science and Engineering Division until becoming associate administrator of NASA's scientific science mission directorate in 20, 2007. His research has focused on studies of our solar system's Kuiper belt and Oort cloud, comets, satellites of outer planets, Pluto, and the search for evidence of planetary systems around other stars. He's also worked on spacecraft rendezvous theory, what? <laughs> terrestrial polar mesoscopic clouds, galactic astrophysics, and studies of tenuous satellite atmospheres, including the atmosphere of the moon. He has won numerous awards. In 2007, he was listed among Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. And he won the 2016 Cosmos Award from the Planetary, Sci uh, Planetary Society, awarded by none other than Bill Nye, the science guy. <laughs> the American Astronautical Society awarded him the Carl Sagan Memorial Award in 2016. And he received the 2016 NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal the space agency's highest civilian honor. Um, I have to add that this past summer, Alan was part of a team that used an Ocean Gate Expedition submersible Titan to explore the RMS Titanic, some 3.9 kilometers under the surface of the ocean. Um, I don't think his talk is gonna cover that, uh, <laughs> but I bet he might be willing to answer some questions at the end if you're curious about that eventually. Without further ado, Alan Stern.
Thank you, Vicki. Uh, and thank you uh, all for coming out tonight. Uh, I have to tell you, we had a very nice dinner at the faculty club just before this, and this microphone has to be kept so close to my lips that it feels like I'm eating dessert the entire time. <laughs> um, so I'm really happy to come and talk to you about uh, something something amazing. Um, I, I will say, uh, I'm actually, the Titanic does show up in this presentation, actually, even before Vicki has to go. Uh, but uh, uh, I have a, a story, and it's one of my favorite stories that I'm going to tell to you and answer questions uh, during this hour. Um, what you're seeing behind me, above me, and on the Zoom, uh, is the first double planet system ever explored by humans. It's the Pluto system. That's Pluto, the colorful one in the foreground, and its giant moon called Charon in the background. I'll have a lot more to say about this pair and what we found scientifically a little bit later. Um, but I have to tell you, the story that I'm going to tell tonight sounds like science fiction, but it's not. I'm going to tell you the story of a team of people who wanted to explore farther than humans had ever explored. That team spent 14 years raising a billion dollars to build a spacecraft competed with other teams to win NASA's permission to spend that money and be the team to design and build that spacecraft. And then we launched it and flew it across the solar system to the very frontier of our planetary system, where we, as Brittany said, explored Pluto and its system of satellites, and then went on billions of additional miles and are still exploring to this day. Um, but first, I'm going to start with something a little bit risky. I'm going to start way in the back. Um, uh, and I thought I would ask of you, how many of you here in the audience, just raise your hands, are or were STEM majors, one type or another? Half, maybe half. Well, I got to tell you, ever since I was a little boy, the only thing I ever wanted to do was to grow up and be a scientist and to be involved in space exploration. And I realized. I'm saying that with a slide of myself at age five with my first scientific instrument, which did not look up, but which looked down. But I think it's the only instrument I ever, ever used that looked down. Um, but ever since I can remember, it's what I wanted to do. And fortunately, I got to grow up and, and was fortunate enough to be able to go to college and graduate school, have a career in this business. And a lot of it has been around space missions and using ground-based observatories to do research, to study our own solar system primarily. But for those of you who might be involved now in studying to be to have a career in science or engineering, they're fascinating careers. And it's a lot more than just what goes on a chalkboard or on your computer or at scientific meetings. In my own case, I've had a bunch of interesting experiences beyond space flight. I spent a month at the South Pole from the National Science Foundation of the United States uh, doing scientific research down there. I spent five years flying jet fighters for NASA doing astronomical research from the stratosphere. I did get to go to the Titanic as the mission scientist on July 22nd and dive down uh, to this wreckage uh, four kilometers beneath the, the North Atlantic. And I was very fortunate in 2020 to be named by NASA to be the first scientist uh, who will fly a, a research mission on Virgin Galactic, um, flying a suborbital space spaceflight next year. Um, but of all the things that I've been involved in, I have to say, nothing comes close to the story of New Horizons. Um, on the left and the right are pictures of me. On the left, you see the rocket that launched New Horizons on its launch pad back in January of 2006. It's hard to tell, that rocket uh, is 80 meters high. It's just very far behind me. It's as large as virtually any building in downtown Montreal. Uh, and then the picture on the right is inside the nose cone of that rocket in a clean suit uh, beneath the little spacecraft, which is maybe the size of this desk, that we launched across the solar system called New Horizons. And what makes this project so inspiring for me 
is that it's really a people story. It's a story of people who wanted to do something larger than life and worked at it very hard and against very tough odds, uh, but managed to raise the money to build it in record time, to do it for a record low budget and make it all work. Uh, and it is an epic journey. It doesn't look very hard here. This is a kind of a cartoon view of our solar system, the planetary system in which the Earth orbits. And the Earth's orbit is on that innermost little white circle with the sun in the middle. And for scale, the distance from that little circle to the sun is 150 million kilometers. And this entire scale, you're seeing a structure that's about 10 billion kilometers across. The four white orbits that you see there, that all lie in one plane, are the orbits of the giant planets of our solar system. The closest is Jupiter, and it's half a billion miles, or about 750 million kilometers, 800 million kilometers from the Earth. And then at twice that distance is the orbit of Saturn, and then the orbit of Uranus, and then the orbit of Neptune. And beyond that, you see that donut of dots. That's a structure that was discovered in the 1990s. It's the largest structure in our planetary system. It's called the Kuiper Belt. It was named for a mid 20th century astronomer named Gerard Kuiper, who hypothesized that this structure existed from circumstantial data. But it took until the 1990s to have the technology uh, with CCD cameras and what were then considered fast computers to actually dig it out of the data and to find it. And the Kuiper Belt is the home of both Pluto and a very large number of objects, trillions of them, left over from the formation of our solar system. And because it's so far from the sun, the temperatures there are very low, almost absolute zero. Literally, the temperature is 30 degrees above absolute zero. That's minus 300 essentially. And as a result of being in this deep freeze, all of the objects that are out there are very well preserved. So, in effect, the Quaker Bell is an archaeological dig into the formation era of our solar system. Uh, but there's more to it. Um, people often ask me, how did you get to do something like New Horizons? Um, the first thing that I tell them is it took a lot of persistence. When we first got the idea, I was in graduate school and with a, a bunch of uh, graduate students and postdocs, um, we were watching as this fabled mission called Voyager that NASA put together in the 1970s and 80s was tearing its way, making the first explorations of all the giant planets. And when it got to Neptune, it was done. And we asked, well, what about Pluto? Well, it's in the wrong direction. Um, well, why don't we have a mission to Pluto? Um, well, it's very expensive and it takes a long time. Um, anyway, we persisted at that. And it took, as I said earlier, 14 years five separate iterations of spacecraft design and, um, and different teams that we put together and uh, a lot of failures, but also a lot of persistence because we really wanted to see this done in part for exploration reasons and in part because for planetary scientists, the very best missions, the ones that are scientifically most attractive are when you can go to a brand new place or a new kind of object and see it for the first time up close. Because then all the science is there. And after that, second mission, third mission, 20th mission to Mars, what have you, are asking more and more detailed questions. And those are cool, but they're just completely different than going to a place for the first time. Um, but we also wanted to go to Pluto because it was scientifically fascinating. And even way back then, we knew that it had a complex surface geology, we knew that it had a giant moon and it was a double planet, as I described before, and no spacecraft had ever been to something like that. We knew it had an atmosphere, mostly made of nitrogen, which is most of what we're breathing here in this room on Earth. And we had many other reasons to believe scientifically it was going to be a bonanza. 
But as I said, NASA didn't buy the first study and NASA didn't buy the second study. Well, it turns out NASA didn't buy the third full study either. And, uh, you know, when it gets to be six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, it's, it really takes a lot of motivation to hold your team together. But the prize was so spectacular that we just wouldn't take no for an answer. And uh, finally, there came a reason for this to get high enough in the priority queue to get funded. And all that interesting science that I just described to you was getting us into the A-list every time. But the A-list isn't high enough because NASA gets about 100 proposals for every one mission they can afford to fly. And all of those are good ideas. None of them are stinkers. They all can produce great science. But what put this over the top was a revolution in the field of planetary science. And to tell you about that revolution, I want to go over a little bit of astronomy now. Everybody in the room saw a picture like this of great school, I suspect. I know I did. It's, it's a map of our planetary system. As we thought, it was architected in the mid-20th century. And many of you know this story. That, that diagram has the orbits of the four rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, way down close to the sun. And they're all pretty small planets. And then an asteroid belt, and then four gargantuan, frequently gargantuan gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, orbiting much further out. And then Pluto, discovered in 1930 that didn't fit either path. Kind of a who ordered that planet at the edge of the solar system? It's in a bit of a weird orbit. It's much further out. It turns out it's smaller. Um, didn't make any sense. How many of you watch CSI or know about CSI? Right? Crime show, right? You know, there's always one clue to the crime that leads you ultimately to the resolution of it. Pluto was the clue to understanding the true architecture of our solar system. Pluto looked like an oddball, like a misfit, a planet that didn't belong out there, that didn't fit either pattern. Turned out it wasn't a misfit, it wasn't an oddball, it was the harbinger of an era of discovery across the 1990s to today, in which we discovered that structure, the Kuiper Belt, teeming with tiny bodies the size of cities and counties, but also littered with small planets like Pluto. And every one of these planets in this diagram is a real place, part of Pluto's cohort, the dwarf planets of the Kuiper Belt. There are more dwarf planets in our solar system than there are gas giants and Earth-like terrestrial planets combined. And it's an amazing revolution. Not only do we discover the largest structure in the solar system and the home to most of the comets that we see, they come from the Kuiper Belt, but we discovered that Pluto was just the first, the biggest and the brightest of this whole population of small planets that litter the outer solar system. And that our solar system is really good at making planets, most of them small. Pluto being about mid-size between the smallest ones and Jupiter. And when that realization sunk in around the early 2000s, in the U.S. planetary science community, the priority of sending a spacecraft to explore Pluto went way up because the exploration of Pluto and its moons became a lot more than just learning about Pluto and those moons. It was about studying the first of a whole new class of planet, the third class of planet in our solar system, these dwarf planets in the Kuiper Belt. And so every 10 years, there's a process called a decadal survey in our field, and they rank those 100 proposals, and the ones at the very top get funded, and the other 95 don't. And the exploration of Pluto rose to the top because of this discovery of the Kuiper Belt and the fact that it's teeming with small planets like Pluto. So we've been exploring the solar system for 50 years. We've been to all four of the terrestrial planets. We've been to all four of the giant planets. We've been to comets and asteroids, but then it was realized that there's this whole third class of planet. We haven't been to any of them. And so the funding was unleashed to do a mission to Pluto. And my team, called New Horizons, 
formed consisting of the place where I work, the Southwest Research Institute, and the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab as the anchor partners, and a bunch of uh, mostly university scientists from around the United States and a few Canadians, um, uh, uh, mostly from Western Canada. Uh, and uh, we competed with four other teams to write proposals. And when I say write a proposal, we're talking about a, a document that's this thick. It's a thousand pages of engineering designs and orbital mechanics, management plans, cost and budget plans, all of that. They're reviewed by experts and they rank those different proposals. These are teams of 100 people that it takes to write them. And our proposal called New Horizons, this is actually the cover of the, that proposal back in 2001 when we competed. Our proposal won. And the other teams didn't get funded and we did get funded. The only problem was in order to get to Pluto efficiently, we had to do a flyby of the planet Jupiter to use Jupiter's giant gravity to slingshot the spacecraft on. And Jupiter turned out was only going to be in position for the launch one year that we could launch to it in 2006. And if we did not launch that year, you come back one Jupiter orbit later in 2018. So we needed to get this whole project done, the design, the fabrication, and the testing of this spacecraft in just four years. From late 2001, when we were selected to be NASA's team, until late 2005, when we had to have it down in Florida at the launch site. And that's about half as much time as major planetary missions normally take. So I call those years for my team, 2,500 men and women who worked on this project across the United States, the blur. Because we worked nights and weekends for four years straight. And it was whatever it takes. Because we were trying to do an eight or nine or 10 year project in four years. And if we didn't make that schedule, there was no arguing with Professor Newton, the orbital mechanics weren't going to let us get to Pluto for another dozen years. Um, but we did succeed. This is a cartoon view of the spacecraft that we built. Uh, it has seven scientific instruments with funny names that you see there, like Alice and Rex and Ralph and so forth. Very high tech scientific instruments compared to past planetary science missions in a miniaturized package that, as I said, is only about the size of this table here. It's nuclear power because we're going so far from the sun that you can't use solar power. And it, its design is dominated by a big dish antenna to communicate with the Earth. This is an actual picture of that spacecraft after it was built. And I like this picture because you can see that big dish antenna. You can see the nuclear power generator, which is the, um, the black cylinder on the left side. It looks sort of like a hair curler, but it's not. It's a nuclear battery. Um, you can see the structure of the spacecraft, and you can see people around it to show you how compact it is. Everything needed for that journey to cross the entirety of our solar system, communication systems, navigation systems, propulsion systems, power, thermal control, all the scientific instruments, all the flash drive data recorders, and everything else goes in that one little box. And like Noah's Ark, we actually carry two of everything. So backup propulsion, backup guidance computer, backup transmitters, backup receivers, and on and on and on. And all of that had to fit in a tiny little package that even with the fuel on the board only weighed 480 kilos. We built it to be small for a specific reason, because the smaller your spacecraft, the faster the rocket will make it go. And we bought the biggest rocket that was then made. It's called the Atlas V. And we we bought the highest performance version of it with five solid rocket motors, each 25 meters high, with a lightweight nose cone so that it would go even faster, with a special third stage that had never been put on it before to make it go even faster. And the entire idea was to take this tiny little spacecraft and launch it as fast as you can to cross this giant gulf of our entire solar system in a short period of time, which worked out to be nine years. That's a long time, but it's a short time when you talk about the distances that are involved. 
And what you see here is our Atlas V with a decal for New Horizons on it. Down in Florida at the launch site in January of 2006, just a couple of weeks before we launched it, in the hangar, this enormous hangar the size of a downtown building where the rocket was assembled. And this is a picture of myself in front of the rocket with the spacecraft inside the nose cone on the day that we fueled the nuclear power battery with plutonium, the element that it radioactively decays to produce heat and ultimately to power the spacecraft all the way across the solar system. Uh, and by the way, just for trivia's sake, the element plutonium discovered in the late 1930s was named for the planet Pluto discovered in the early 1930s. Um, so uh, here you can see the spacecraft again inside that nose cone. You can see how small it is. And just six days later, we launched it on the 19th of January, 2006, on that Atlas rocket, on a journey that took it until 2015 to reach its main target, Pluto. So off across the solar system, we went. First stop, Jupiter, for that gravity assist. And we actually set a record. We crossed the half billion miles, the 800 million kilometers, from Earth's orbit to Jupiter's orbit in just 13 months. No spacecraft had ever made that, that crossing so fast. I'll give you another feel for the speed. When I was a little boy, Apollo missions used to launch to the moon at 25,000 miles an hour, and it took three days to get there. When New Horizons was launched, it reached the orbit of the moon in nine hours, which is roughly 0.3 days, not three days, but 0.3 days. At this blinding speed, it took 13 months to get to Jupiter's orbit, nine and a half years to cross the middle of our solar system to get to that yellow orbit that you see there. That's Pluto's orbit. And our red trajectory line crosses Pluto's orbit in 2015. So we spent a decade flying this spacecraft across the solar system and planning the scientific assault using all seven of these scientific instruments to choreograph them to make all of the imaging and compositional measurements and atmospheric measurements and other things that we did. Over 400 different scientific observations of Pluto and its five moons in the summer of 2015. At Jupiter, uh, uh, we not only used the planet as our gravity assist slingshot, but also as a kind of flight test. This was the only thing that we passed a long way. So this was our chance to practice a flyby with the scientific instruments, the spacecraft, all the software, the thrusters, the guidance system, everything, to make sure that we worked all the kinks out. Because when we went by Pluto in 2015, there was no going back and trying a second time. There wasn't even a second spacecraft like the Voyagers, Voyager 1 and 2, or the old Mariners and Pioneers that went in pairs. In case one didn't work, you get a second try. There was only one new horizon. So Jupiter was our chance to test all of this. And it works spectacularly. We found a few little things, but mostly, and I'd say mostly, I should say vastly, it worked. When we got that gravity assist, it added 5,000 miles per hour to our speed. We conducted all kinds of scientific observations of the Jupiter system, and we proved out that our sensors and our spacecraft and our software all played very well together in a real world flyby, sort of like a re rehearsal for Pluto. Um, and then we flew eight years, two Obama administrations across the solar system, where our job was to take care of that spacecraft and not screw it up, and to be ready for that one-shot flyby of the Pluto system. And, uh, and let me now tell you a little bit about the Pluto flyby. Actually, the two people here, the man is Glenn Fountain. Glenn uh, was the project manager for New Horizons. Um, from 2004 until 2016, after the Pluto flyby. And um, he's standing just outside of our mission control, which is in uh, Maryland, the state of Maryland. And then in the uh, inset in the upper right, uh, you see Becca Seapan, one of our uh, flight controllers at mission control. Um, it's not a very big mission control. It's not like the ISS space station mission control or the space shuttle mission control. It only takes two people to fly New Horizon, sometimes three when we're really busy. Um, and our job was to put software up on the spacecraft that could 
cause it to choreograph all of the instrument turn-ons and turn-back offs to save power and all the data collection in the recorders and all the pointings going by Pluto and its five moons as the spacecraft went through the system at almost 40,000 miles an hour, over 60,000 kilometers per hour. And meanwhile, Pluto is racing across in its orbit at a blinding speed of almost 10,000 kilometers per hour, and all the moons are in orbit going around. And we had to program all of that and navigate the spacecraft to be just in the right spot to get all the pictures and spectra and other data types. Um, and to be able to do that using these seven scientific instruments on six different objects, Pluto and five moons, on one day, the 14th of July, 2015. Because the next day, we're gone. Another million miles, we're passing. It. The day before, we're too far out to take good data. So it all came down to one day in the summer of 2015. And it all worked out. This is a uh, kind of a family portrait with Pluto in true color taken by New Horizons just about a day before we got there. And the big moon, Sharon. By the way, for scale, how big is Pluto? Um, from one side of the planet to the other is about as far as from the Atlantic Ocean across the United States, two thirds of the way to the Pacific Ocean, about to Colorado where I live. And the big moon, Sharon, is about half that side, half that diameter. And then beyond that, the upper left, you see two little kind of ice cubes. Those are two of the four small moons of Pluto that aren't big enough to be rounded by self-gravity. And so they look a little bit like ice cubes or potatoes, but except they're tens of kilometers across. Now, this is the image that I showed you before. It's a family portrait of the double planet, Pluto and Sharon. And there, this is a true picture. It's actually two pictures montaged together, one of Pluto, one of Sharon because we never saw it from this angle. But you can notice immediately how different these two bodies appear to be, and they are very different. Pluto is the big colorful one. Sharon is darker, much more muted colors. Most of the reason that Pluto is so colorful and so bright are both tied to the fact that it's got an atmosphere and it's got weather. And that causes it to snow on Pluto's surface. And those snows refresh the surface all the time with fresh snow. It makes it much brighter, and the snows come in different colors depending upon what they're made of. It's kind of a sci-fi world, and I'll show you some examples of that. But I want to say a word or two about the moon, the big moon, Sharon, which itself is pretty large. From one limb here to the other is about as big as the state of Texas. And this world, 1,240 kilometers across, is made of water ice. Everything you're seeing on the surface, we know it because we spectrally fingerprinted it, is water ice. And you see a giant canyon system across the, uh, uh, the equator. You see a kind of anti-polar cap at the north, the top. Um, lots of interesting geology, lots we can learn about how the whole Pluto system was made from this. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into that. Instead, I want to give you kind of a potpourri of results of things we saw at Pluto. Now, here's a close-up image. This is actually not a single image, but it's a stitched together set of images wrapped in the computer onto a sphere. So it gives you exactly the view you would have had you been aboard New Horizons. If you were an astronaut aboard New Horizons, simply looking down on the planet. And the biggest thing that you see there is a giant glacier made of something exotic, made of nitrogen ice. That big white teardrop shaped region, which is about a million square kilometers of glacier, the largest glacier in our solar system, um, sits in a giant basin that was blasted out late in Pluto's formation when an asteroid sized thing hit Pluto and carved this giant basin out, which became a sink, a place where ice is like to collect. And for 4 billion years, as it snowed, the ice has got deeper and deeper, and that glacier is kilometers thick now. It's like Antarctica, except it's not made of water snow. It's made of nitrogen snow. And if you look closely, and unfortunately my cursor doesn't show up well, but if you look around the perimeter of that bright nitrogen glacier, you see mountain ranges. Those mountain ranges are very tall. They're five to six kilometers tall. 
They would be among the tallest mountain ranges on earth if they were here. But they're not made of rock, they're made of water ice, and they're covered in a coating of more exotic ices, like nitrogen ice, like the glacier, carbon monoxide ice, and methane ice, what we call natural gas. This truly is a sci-fi planet. And those mountain ranges were raised by the force of that impact as it carved out that basin, which itself is the size of Texas and Oklahoma combined. Here's something else we saw, and we studied in great detail as Pluto's atmosphere, which is blue, just like the skies of the Earth. It has clouds. It has real meteorology. It has haze layers that stretch a half million meters into the sky. We saw mountain ranges with snow caps across the planet. This is a planet 5 billion kilometers away with familiar looking terrains. The physics that produces this, and the geophysics and the geology, are very reminiscent of what's going on on Earth, but the constructional materials are completely different. You don't have granite and basalt or other rock types. These structures are all made of ices down at that low temperature, only 30 degrees above absolute zero. And yet they're also coated with snow caps, but the snow is not, again, water snow. In this case, those bright snow caps on those mountains are made of methane, natural gas. Fortunately, there's no oxygen in Pluto's atmosphere. So it can't burst into flames like it would if you had natural gas snow here on the Earth. But there are other kinds of exotic terrains like these, these we call uh, snakeskin terrains. This is a, a piece of Pluto about the size of the state of Colorado, hundreds of kilometers across, with mountains that have aligned themselves all these blades that are mountains, each about a kilometer tall, there are thousands of them. And somehow they organize themselves into this, this um, uh, snakeskin type terrain. And we don't know how it was built. No one's seen anything like this anywhere else in the solar system. We also saw that Pluto has on its surface very heavily cratered terrains. And to a planetary scientist, that, that translates to old. It's just like if it's raining outside, the longer you're out in the rain, the more dots of water hit you. Well, out in the Kuiper Belt, it's raining impactors. And terrains that are older have just been hit a lot more, and they're very heavily cratered like this. We can do the math, and based on the number of craters and their sizes, we can figure out, because we know the impactor population, how old the surface must be. And when we do that math, it turns out to be four and a half billion years old. This place on Pluto is as old as the planet in our solar system. But right next to it is this place on the glacier. And there are no craters whatsoever. Not one. No matter how hard you look, you will not find it. We put 100 scientists on this for two months with microscopes. There are no craters on that glacier, which is itself a million square kilometers. That means the glacier is not old. It's extremely young, or it would have those craters on it. And we can surmise by knowing again that impact rate that this glacier, this structure the size of Texas and Oklahoma combined, must have been created just a few million years ago. Now, the odd thing about that is, uh, as you know, Pluto is a small planet. And small planets were thought to always cool off much faster than big planets. It's like if you had a cup of coffee on a cold morning. That cup of coffee will cool off much faster than a big vat of coffee sitting outside at the same temperature because the big vat has a lot more thermal inertia and not as much radiating area. So it just can't cool off as fast. And every small planet that we visited in our solar system was deader and less active than the bigger planets until we got to Pluto. And somehow Pluto never read the textbooks. And this little planet out in near absolute zero temperatures is somehow creating enormous geological features today, four and a half billion years after it was formed. And no one knows really how that happened, but it's completely contrary to standard geophysical paradigm. And it's one of the big head scratchers of what we learn is that small planets can be as active as big planets, even billions of years, after their formation. We just wish we knew how that's the case. We saw other things. Here, this is a topographic map where the colors tell you altitudes. 
and the red colors are the tallest, and then the yellow and the green. And what you see in the upper right hand portion of the image are uh, big fields of mountains. And then down where it's purple on the lower left, that's the plain down on the glacier. And where the, the diamond shape, the black diamond is, you'll notice on the right hand side, there's a chute, like a valley from the mountains, six kilometers above the plain, down onto the glacier. And you see those red arrows? where snow has fallen down the chute and pooled out, caused by an avalanche. Probably means that there are earthquakes going on, but there are other ways to explain that as well. But regardless of how you cut it, it's another sign of activity on the surface of this small world. We also found volcanoes, but not volcanoes that spew lava, that spew ice. They're called cryovolcanoes. This one is the size of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. It's four and a half kilometers tall. It's 150 kilometers across. You can't find a single crater on its flanks because it too was created yesterday geologically. Who was doing all of this, not just one thing, making a big glacier or having an atmosphere that snows all the time or having avalanches or ice volcanoes. It's doing all those things. This little planet turns out to be as active as the Earth or Mars and as complex. Usually, smaller things are simpler in our solar system. Pluto is the complete counterexample. There's one more example I'm going to show you. This is a frozen lake bed. It's a lake bed made of liquid nitrogen that's frozen, and it's in a hanging mountain valley. And we know it's in a hanging mountain valley because we have images from different angles that we can reconstruct stereoscopically to see it in 3D. And you can see the shoreline around this lake is about 30 kilometers along that long axis. And the interesting thing here is that the liquid nitrogen that was in that lake cannot exist on Pluto's surface at its present temperature and pressure. Not even close. For those of you who are physics or chemistry majors, the technical way you put that is, is that uh, the atmospheric conditions don't get to the triple don't get to the enough pressure and temperature to let liquids exist on the surface. So seeing this, it's again, it's like CSI. This is a forensic clue. Pluto used to have a dramatically thicker atmosphere that would allow liquids to pool on its surface, but that atmosphere went away. It's not there now. And those liquids cooled and froze because they can't stay as liquid at the current low pressure. Well, those are just some examples of the things that we found in a Pluto flyby. Now I'm going to show you a little movie where we stitch together a whole bunch of images, close-ups, as we go from the North Pole of Pluto down onto that glacier. We're flying across the surface with images from New Horizons, across the polar badlands. You can look inside of craters and see layering in the surface. You can see dust battle tracks from things that we think or something like tornadoes that blew across the surface. And then we can get onto mountain ranges, again, made of water ice and coated in nitrogen snows. And you can see the scale bar, six miles, that's 10 kilometers. And then off onto the glacier where you can see dune fields and all kinds of interesting structure in the glacier that indicates it's in a kind of roving boil from some food source beneath it. Like I said, it sounds like science fiction, but it's not. We built a spacecraft that flew across the solar system to the farthest worlds ever explored and discovered all these things with some cameras and spectrometers that we built in your neighboring country. It's amazing what humans can do in big teams when they put their mind to it. When you put talented people together with a common goal. Well, after we flew by Pluto, the spacecraft is still moving outwards. And so we went on a mission to study other things in the Kuiper Belt and have been doing that now since 2015. Um, the most notable thing that we did is we flew, flew by one of the building blocks of planets like Pluto. This odd shaped structure on that screen is what we call a planetesimal. It's a building block of planets like Pluto and the Kuiper Belt is teeming with them. We found this one with the Hubble Space Telescope and then we fired the engines on the spacecraft to target a flyby, which we did in 2019. This was not easy. First of all, unlike showing up in Pluto, which is nearly the size of North America, this is like showing up with the city of Montreal 
moving at 10,000 kilometers per hour in the dark. And we had to target that. Uh, I'll give you a feel for how small it is. Here's Pluto. And if I can make this little video show, as we zoom up on mountains next to Pluto, I can put that Kuiper belt object, it's called Arakal, next to it. We had to navigate our way in the darkness of the outer solar system to an intercept on one particular day with this little thing the size of a mountain block on Pluto. And we did that. And we hit a bullseye. And this is a close-up color image of it. It looks kind of funny. It looks like a bowling pin. It's actually two things that merge together, that each form individually. But if you look, you'll see there's no sign of a high-speed impact. They came together very slowly. And that's a clue to how things form in the early days. They had to be on neighboring orbits. And they had to only cross at very low speeds, like walking speeds, or they would shatter. If something the size of a mountain hits something else the size of a mountain at like the speed of a car, it's going to blow itself to smithereens. This had to come together very gently. Here's an even better close-up, but it's not in color. You can also see the flattened 3D nature of this, this thing, Aerocon. It's not just two bodies that came together gently. They're also um, sort of planar. Each individual is flat like a pancake. That tells us another clue to how things formed out there. They must have formed in a little disk, a little local disk, where they come together very gently, but in a flat structure to make these objects themselves flat. Moreover, particularly for those of you who are studying something technical, when you look at the way that these two individual objects called the lobes are aligned, they are almost perfectly aligned. Their principal axes, if you know that term, are aligned within a few degrees in each of the three principal axes. That could happen by an accident, but the odds, if you just took two things and stuck them together randomly, that they wouldn't come together like this, or like this, or like that, or like that, but that they would come together aligned, we can simulate that. It's called the Monte Carlo process. It's like one in 10,000. That's probably not what happened. It's not a one in 10,000. As these two things were forming in this little NATO cloud, orbiting one another, their orbit started to shrink as they ejected other objects from the cloud. And as they got really close, their own mutual gravities took over. And the tides between the two objects had long enough to act to make them reach this very special equilibrium position in which we can simulate this in a computer and show it to be what happens in a very gentle process of merger. It's so gentle that in the scientific paper describing this to the journal Science, I called it a docking. And the editor said, you can't use that word. That sounds like it was done by two spaceships with like pilots. So we call it a merger, a very gentle merger. Okay? But these are three separate clues to how this thing formed. And we think we now understand for the first time how the building blocks of planets form. We never went to anything like this before because in the inner solar system, all the collision speeds are fast and everything is heated by the sun and all the original evidence is masked by a lot of evolution that's taking place over four billion years. But out in the Kuiper Belt, we have this pristine, cold environment that preserves that early record. And we see the evidence of the gentle collision, the tidal evolution, the disk-like formation process that took place. And we solved the major puzzle of planetary science, which is how things come together into the building blocks of planets. There have been debates of computer models for decades, literally since the 60s. And it was like these warring computer models. It would add more and more physics, but they would get very different results. And we showed that only one of those two models, the general accretion model, can be correct. And the more violent accretion model just can't be correct because all of the data points to the general accretion model. So that is very quickly the story of New Horizons, how it came to be and what it's done. Um, it's a much bigger story than that. And with my colleague, David Grinspoon, I wrote this book back in 2018, which is a much more detailed story and really an under the hood inside view of how this mission came to be and how we flew it across the solar system. Um, and uh, uh, my mother's bought a lot of copies, but I would appreciate if someone knew what it is. It's called Chasing New Horizons. It's sold at bookstores, it's sold at Amazon, it's sold everywhere. Um, 
even my daughter's bookstore in Tucson, Antigone will sell it to you. Um, maybe if you're interested, you'll buy a copy. Uh, meanwhile, New Horizons continues to sail outward. We're looking for another flyby target. The spacecraft is healthy. It's taking data every single day as it marches out further and further exploring. It's got power and communications range to fly for 25 more years. NASA just funded us for a new extension for a few of those years, and we'll see in the future if we get funded to go further and further. Um, but this little piece of human workmanship designed in the early 2000s, launched in 2006, is still working perfect. Almost 17 years after the launch, in January, it'll be 17 years. It's an amazing piece of engineering, and it's done some amazing science. And thank you for having me here to talk about this tonight. I'm happy to answer questions. So thank you very much, Alan. Fantastic talk, fantastic work. I'm sure he's happy to answer questions and I'm certain we will have questions online too. Who wants to be first? There's a bonus for being first. The bonus is you get a second chance. Go for it. So uh, you mentioned that at one point, uh, it's late on um, the Pluto sort of froze over. What events or process do you think led to a reduction in Pluto's atmosphere? Yeah, I just thought we'd make it a little easier to be first. This is what I consider the coolest bumper sticker on the planet. It says my other vehicle is on its way to Pluto. Where did you get one? Ask them the first time. Okay, good man, give me the key and the second and third question also did bumper stickers. Or you can keep one. Wow, I think I can keep these. Sorry. So the question was how did Pluto's atmosphere get reduced? Yeah. So uh, you know, I had to rush through a lot of things, but what we actually think is going on is that the atmosphere comes and goes with time. And there's an orbital cycle that's connected to the polar tilt of Pluto, very much like something on the Earth called Milankovitch cycles. They're an orbital cycle connected to how the tilt of the Earth changes that drive climate cycles on the Earth and similarly do it on Pluto. So we have pretty good evidence that these cycles have happened about a thousand times since Pluto was born, in which it's had a thick atmosphere and then a few million years, a thin atmosphere like it does now, and then a thick atmosphere again, and then it just repeats and it breathes and it goes back and forth through these cycles now a thousand times. You mentioned uh, Eric Hoffman was uh, found with Hubble. Uh, so could you tell us what kind of work is being done now to, the, to detect a, another target? Yes, um, Eric Kopp was found with Hubble in 2014 after a long search using giant ground-based telescopes that came up dry. The Hubble came to the rescue in a space of about two weeks in the summer of 2014, found Eric Kopp and a few other objects. We could have flown by in 2019, we picked Eric Kopp. Turns out, you know, of course, now we're looking for something dramatically almost twice as far out. And that means it's not twice as faint, but the sunlight dims with the square of the distance. It's twice as far out, so it's two squared, four times fainter sunlight, but then all that light has to reflect back to the Earth. So it's actually two to the fourth power times dimmer. And it turns out, that given the march of technology, the best way to find something like that is now not with Hubble, but back with ground-based telescopes. And we're using one of the biggest in the world. It's called the Subaru Telescope in Hawaii. It's a Japanese facility, and it has the biggest megapixel camera with the widest field of view on the back end of any big telescope. And every summer, we go looking for needles in the haystack along the trajectory of new horizons. We found hundreds of them, but so far we haven't found one within the uh, uh, reach of the spacecraft. It only has a certain amount of fuel. So we have to find one that's gonna come very close to our trajectory. And we just keep looking. Um, and that persistence paid off for us before. Uh, it took four years to find Erikov. So far we've been at this search three years and uh, we already have proposal time for next summer. And we're gonna keep searching. I think Carolina actually has a question from online. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I have some questions from the chat. Um, 
So here we have a good one. Uh, why do dwarf planets outnumber the other two types? What causes them to be so populous? Well, that's a great question. Hey, sorry, can you repeat it? Yeah, the, the question is why do the dwarf planets outnumber the bigger planets, the other two types of planets? Great question. If I knew the answer, I'd probably win a scientific reward because no one knows the answer. However, we do know as a rule of thumb in our solar system that there are many more small bodies than big ones. And we know that in our galaxy, there are many more smaller stars than bigger stars. And you can say the same thing about smaller galaxies and bigger galaxies. Generally, in the astronomical sciences, of which planetary science is one, the smaller bodies outnumber the bigger bodies. Um, and it, that's probably connected to the answer, but we don't know exactly why we think the solar system made about a thousand planets like Pluto and only a handful of planets the size of the Earth. So from a census standpoint, the solar system is mostly made up of Plutos with just a few other things scattered around. Yeah, yeah I have uh, two short questions, which might take a bit long. Yeah. So uh, the first one is, are there any other more bizarre things that you guys discovered in the Kuiper Belt? And uh, the second question is, what's like, beyond the Kuiper Belt? Like, what is the next mission for New Horizon? Yeah, okay, great questions. Um, so let me start with the second question. What's next for New Horizons? Um, we're going to be in the Kuiper Belt almost the rest of the 2020s, even traveling at this high speed. It's just a large structure. Um, once we get beyond the Kuiper Belt, um, there's another structure, which is called the Oort Cloud, but it's 100 times further away and will take New Horizons 1,000 years. It will get there, but it will long be dead. There's no power left. It can't communicate from out there. So really for us, it's a Kuiper Belt mission, and then it's just studying the space environment, studying astronomy, other things from far away. But probably no more flybys after we leave the Kuiper Belt in the late 20s, right? What was your first question? About uh, any other bizarre objects? Right. Well, it turns out the other bizarre objects in the Kuiper Belt. It turns out the planets of the Kuiper Belt are very diverse. They're as diverse as the planets in the inner solar system. And so uh, we have planets that are different colors, and we have planets with different compositions, and we have planets with different numbers of moons. Even in one case, an egg-shaped planet, probably the result of a collision. But the point here is that there's a great diversity of planets out in the Kuiper Belt. And why that should be so, no one knows. It's bizarre. You would think if they're all made out there in the same deep freeze, from the same stuff, from the same cloud of material that's out there, they would turn out the same. But there's this huge diversity. It's like the diversity in this room or in this country, right? There's a lot of different kinds of people. There's a lot of different kinds of planets out there and they're all begging for exploration. Um, that's probably a job for your generation, not mine. Get to it. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, how does the like why like if you were to look at the, the photos that we're seeing on Pluto, uh, how do they look like the naked eye if you were to look at them versus how they've been processed in terms of exposure? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really great question. So as as I said, it's very the sunlight is very faint because you're very far from the sun. Yeah, to use numbers, the sunlight at Pluto is about a thousand times fainter than on a crystal clear blue sky day here on Earth. A thousand times fainter. It's, it's about like that maddening dusk after the sun sets, just before it gets really dark. Um, so the sun, the light levels are low. They're plenty bright enough to read a book by, just like at twilight after the sun sets. Um, but it would drive you crazy as an earthling used to a much brighter environment. Nonetheless, with high-tech cameras, the telescopes, we can collect enough light to make the images look very bright, even though they're very softly lit. So what you see is the result of the technology that lets us take great pictures, even in dark conditions. But it is actually very, very dusky out there. But, uh, is there any commission maybe with the GWS to make comparisons with uh, what you have seen? Pluto yeah, I think you're asking about the James Webb Space Telescope, which was just launched. It's the successor and a much bigger successor to the Hubble. 
which is now just in the last year uh, been launched and commissioned, and now it's starting to turn out scientific results. And it's being used to study Pluto, and it's being used to study Kuiper belt objects, but it's really in its infancy. So there are very few scientific results that are out there yet, but over its lifetime, which will probably be the next 10 years, it'll probably make a lot of breakthroughs in its ability to study lots of these things and put what we learned at Arakov and Pluto in context by studying the other dwarf planets of the Kuiper belt and other Kuiper belt objects, small ones like Arakov. How much can we infer about the other exoplanets based on what we know about Pluto now? Uh, so the question is, what can we infer about exoplanets? That's planets in other star systems based on what we learned from flying by Pluto. Well, I think there are many ways to answer that question. Um, the short answer is, is that we should expect to be surprised. You know, I'll tell you a story. Every single time there was a first exploration of a new planet in the solar system, from the very first one in the early 60s with Venus, where it completely surprised them to find Venus had this toxic atmosphere and 800 degree Fahrenheit surface conditions, to Mars that had dry river valleys, to, you know, I could give you examples in Mercury and Jupiter and Saturn. And every single time, surprise and rewriting the textbooks. And I would tell my team in meetings, here we are a generation later. It was our parents' generation of scientists that did all that early exploration of the inner eight planets. What do you say we try and get the last one right? See if we can't take all that accumulated experience of surprises across the solar system and integrate that into our thinking and try to predict what we would find at Pluto. And, and man, we got an A for exploration. We did the mission perfect. Well, we got an F for that because we didn't predict most of what we saw at Pluto. We didn't expect the largest glacier. We didn't expect ice volcanoes and many of the other things that I told you about. Hey, these atmospheric cycles that cause uh, lakes to dry up. And it's just amazing. It just shows how spectacular nature is. And my takeaway from that is, is that every time we go exploring new solar systems, we're going to be surprised over and over. They're just, the nature is so rich and there's so many ways things can be put together. That while Pluto showed us one more example of rewriting the textbooks, we're still in the infancy of space exploration. And someday in a few centuries, when it's really Star Trek and we're really exploring other solar systems and spacecraft, I think there's no end to the variety, the variety of geologies, of formation scenarios, of atmospheres, of solar system architectures, and even probably of life forms. I think nature's just gonna to continue to surprise us. And the big lesson of New Horizons is, is that even with all that experience we got from the first 50 years of space exploration, we couldn't get the last one right. It just taught us once again, we should be humble, that nature is a lot more imaginative than humans. Do you have one from the... I have one from, that was submitted before the talk. Okay. Um, so are there any citizen science projects planned for New Horizons? Well, um, we have done a bunch of citizen science yeah, so projects in the ones. past. I, uh, I just want people to know that as recently as a couple of years ago, we did a citizen science project in which um, we took pictures of the nearest stars from New Horizons and from the Earth at the same time. And the spacecraft is so far away that we could actually see the parallax, the 3D nature of them. And you can now look on the web or in astronomical textbooks and see the first 3D images of star fields made by New Horizons. We are planning a new project, but it's under wraps. So I will teach you with that and, and say <laughs> that the answer is patience. Yes. Answer is yes, we have to wait. Patience, grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, oh, uh, sorry. I just got to go one more. And we can do one more from here. Okay, so go. How does it feel like when set an update this so a spacecraft is this far away uh, knowing that the latency is gonna take? How do you feel when you send an update and you wait to reply to make sure that the update has been solved properly? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, just for those who might not know, the way that we uh, control the spacecraft is by radio. And we send essentially computer programs and computer commands 
up by radio at the speed of light. So they cross the solar system in a few hours to get out there. And then the computers on board do their thing. And then they radio back the results. And we see if it worked. And it, it, it almost always works. Very occasionally, like any programmer, we make a little mistake. But to see that work by remote control on something you actually built and were around is just, it's almost indescribable. Um, and I never get tired of it. And I can tell you that when we sent the program up to do the whole Pluto flyby, you know, tens of thousands of commands, um, I, I sat there at what was literally four in the morning in mission control as they were sending that across the country to California where it was radioed up to the spacecraft. And it just made shiver go up my spine to think that all these people that I know and I know their kids and work so long together that this was it. This was really the instructions for the exploration of a new planet on the edge of our solar system. And then everything about that flyby worked. Everything. And see, we couldn't have had it go better. It's just amazing. And it's just an amazing testament to, uh, to people um, who work in teams together. And uh, and who really believe in excellence and trusting one another, and uh, um, and who have these high educations and have all these amazing skills. What, what humans can do is just amazing, and I am in awe of it. That would actually be a great place to stop. So I think we should call it here. Um, I think that Alan was happy probably to take a few more questions, you know, informally. But why don't we give him a huge thank you? And... Okay. One last thing, Carolina, you mentioned. Sorry, uh, I don't so, really know what it is. So we're waiting. On <laughs> okay, so I just need to stop the live stream. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay.